Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected. Good morning, Team Krulak community, and on behalf of Marine Corps University, the Marine Corps University Foundation, and the Brute Krulak Center for Innovation and Future Warfare, welcome back to the Brutecast, our series designed to connect the worlds of the warfighter and PME with the best in innovative and creative thought. I'm your host, Major Ian Brown, Operations Officer at the Krulak Center. Before we begin, please remember that all opinions expressed here are those of the individual and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Krulak Center, Marine Corps University, the United States Marine Corps, or any other agency of the U.S. government. So we have a great episode today as we get close to the end of the 2021 broadcast season. This is a rare chance for us to both highlight a couple of Marine Corps University's fantastic faculty, as well as bring you a taste of what the students here get to experience in the scholars programs throughout the academic year. This episode is adapted from a lecture recently given to our Women, Peace, and Security Scholars Program, and the feedback from that lecture was so strong that we knew we had to get it into the broadcast lineup. So presenting on today's topic, Gender Integration and Citizenship, a Civil Military Perspective, we're pleased to welcome Dr. Bradford Weinman. Dr. Weinman is a professor of military history at Command and Staff College, Marine Corps University. He was appointed to the Command and Staff College te teaching faculty in July of 2008, serving as War Studies Department Head from 2012 to 2015. Prior to this position, he had served as an Assistant Professor in the Department of Military History, U.S. Army Command and General Staff College since 2006. He received his BA in History from the Virginia Military Institute in 1999 and his MA 2001 and PhD 2006 in History from Texas A&M University, where his research focused on antebellum Southern military education. Dr. Wyman is a member of the U.S. Marine Corps Reserve and is a veteran of Operations Iraqi Freedom and Enduring Freedom. His research specialties include American military education and civil military relations. And joining Dr. Weinman to moderate today's discussion, as well as give an overview of the WPS scholars, we're also pleased to welcome Dr. Lauren McKenzie. Dr. McKenzie is Chair of Military Cross-Cultural Competence at Command and Staff College, Marine Corps University. She also currently serves as the Marine Corps University Faculty Council President, as well as an adjunct professor of Military and Emergency Medicine at the Uniform Services University of Health Sciences. From 2009 to 2014, Dr. McKenzie served as Associate Professor of Cross-Cultural Communication at the U.S. Air Force Culture and Language Center, where she taught resident electives at the Air Command and Staff College and designed and delivered the Introduction to Cross-Cultural Communication online course, completed by over 1,000 airmen annually. Dr. McKenzie earned her MA and PhD in communications from the University of Massachusetts and has taught intercultural competence courses throughout the Department of Defense for more than a decade. She conducts research relating to cross-cultural competence, oversees cultural related curriculum development and outcomes assessment, and delivers communication and cultural lectures across the professional military education spectrum. So uh, as you can tell, we have two uh, very, uh, um, very knowledgeable guests with us here today. And Dr. Wyman, Dr. McKenzie, welcome to you both. Um, and so before we get into the presentation, um, Dr. McKenzie, I'll turn it over to you to give a little bit of background on WPS scholars and kind of why, why we're here and, and what this lecture was a part of. Thanks so much, Major Brown, and good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for taking time out of your day to be with us this morning. Um, so I'll just take about five minutes to just give a little bit of context and just a, a short uh, clip of the history behind the Women, Peace, and Security effort uh, in the Department of Defense um, and talk a little bit about how that led to our WPS Scholars Program that we've piloted this academic year at Marine Corps University, and then finally how that led to Dr. Weinman's presentation on uh, gender integration and citizenship that he delivered for us last week. Um, so just broadly speaking, uh, the women, peace and security effort is really about recognizing the value that diverse perspectives can bring to operational effectiveness. Um, so again, it's a very, a very broad thing. It's not necessarily new to those who have been thinking about it and studying it uh, for decades, um, but it is somewhat new um, in the Department of Defense. So just a little bit of history uh, about two decades ago. 
Um, Hillary Clinton gave a, a pretty famous speech uh, during the UN conference on, on human rights. And she said that, that women's rights are human rights. Um, and that led to a UN Security Council resolution, number 1325, uh, recognizing the disproportionate impact that conflict has on women and, and calling for nations throughout the world um, to develop an, a national action plan um, to talk about what they might do to recognize that and to empower power half the world's population um, in preventing and managing conflict. Um, along the time over the past few decades, you've also had researchers like Valerie Hudson, whose you know, real research agenda has set out to prove that the security of women is tied to the security of states. And her, her data, her research has shown that, you know, when you have things in, an, in a state like, you know, female infanticide or polygamy or female gen genital mutilation, those things can be clues that something else, something negative is also going on in that particular nation or state. Um, and so she has some pretty powerful research to back up the claim um, that what you do to your women, you do to your nation. Um, and so all that being said, there's a lot of momentum leading up to the WPS Act of 2017 that was signed by President Trump asking um, the U.S. to become a leader in integrating gender perspectives into training and education. Um, and this is a whole of government effort. So when we think about WPS, it's kind of a big thing um, and it's really difficult to describe in one sentence or less. Uh, but just for the, the sake of our brief time together, Together today, I'll just say that there are three pillars um, of the WPS effort. Um, it revolves around meaningful participation of women, number one. Number two, it's about acknowledging women's role in sort of preventing and managing conflict. And finally, it's about the integration of a gendered perspective um, in training and education. And that's really um, kind of what led us to this WPS effort called the WPS Scholars Program here at Marine Corps University this academic year. Um, we also wanted to recognize, um, you know, that that the WPS effort has both sort of national and international facets to it. So of course, on the one hand, you have sort of the importance of, of gender advisors and international missions like we had in Afghanistan for many years. Um, but there's also a domestic component to the WPS effort. Um, you know, again, when it comes to the Marine Corps, it's things like, you know, ranges from from policy um, all the way to training education. It's about maybe bringing a gender perspective into our recruitment efforts so that um, you know, our Marines reflect the, the population that they serve. So there's really, like I said, sort of a lot going on with the WPS effort. And one of the things that we wanted to do as part of responding to the WPS Act of 2017 and the subsequent 2020 uh, WPS Strategic Framework and impl Implementation Plan, um, was to, hey, let's get a conversation going. Let's get like-minded folks um, who are interested in WPS, both faculty, staff, and students together for a year-long exploration into the connection between gender and security. And, and so that's where this came about. And the Krulak Center has been just so gracious to host us and um, you know, Val Jackson, the director, and Major Ian Brown, um, who's helping us with this broadcast, has just, yeah, they've been wonderful and generous in helping us get the word out. So this year, uh, we launched the program. We have 12 students uh, as part of our scholars program from both EWS and Command and Staff College um, who are interested in, yeah, in asking questions and getting together with like-minded folks and and again just thinking about all the different facets of, of WPS and how it not only pertains to their studies this year at Marine Corps University uh, but how it can have long-lasting effects across their their careers and just their their personal and professional lives um, so we've had three meetings thus far um, we, our first meeting was sort of tracing the history of WPS, again, from the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 in the year 2000 to the 2020 um, implementation plan, the whole of government implementation plan. From there, uh, Dr. Claire Metellus, who's also a co-leader of our WPS Scholars Program, um, led a discussion about what does it mean to say that war is gendered? And so we read a piece called uh, Wars, uh, Wars, Wimps, and Women. I wanted to make sure I got that 
title right, had a great discussion, a lively discussion about um, what a gender discourse analysis is, what it means to say that war is gendered. And then our last meeting last week uh, led into Dr. Wyman's presentation and on his background, his research uh, regarding sort of a civ civilian military perspective on gender integration um, and citizenship. And it was just fantastic. And we got a great response from the students and we wanted to take the, the time, thanks to Major Ian Brown's idea here, to share it with the larger Marine Corps community. And so that's what we're here to do today is to give uh, Dr. Wyman another chance to, to share with us what, uh, to share with you what he shared with us last week. And I know you won't be disappointed as great passion and great knowledge on this topic. Uh, so Dr. Wyman, over to you um, to deliver your presentation and then we'll follow that up with some Q&A. So over to you, Brett. All right, great. Thanks, Lauren. And, and again, uh, one more thank you to uh, to Ian and to uh, Val Jackson and everybody in Crew Elect for allowing me the opportunity to uh, talk about this with you this uh, this morning. So uh, I guess, yeah, we'll jump right into it here. Uh, I got the slides coming up. So um, so as uh, as Dr. McKenzie foreshadowed here, uh, this this is uh, duplicative of what I presented to the um, uh, WPS scholars last week, uh, which is also duplicative of a, a similar presentation that I gave at a, a NATO gender integration conference that was held actually here at uh, Marine Corps University uh, back in, in 2019. So I, I saw this as an opportunity to kind of revisit uh, some of my ideas, you know, that I, I've been exploring and that I'm very passionate about and, and uh, you know, kind of you know, redirect them a bit into uh, kind of the WPS uh, um, uh, environment here. So I wanted to offer that to you here. I'm going to kind of spin through the slides relatively quickly because I really want to leave room for discussion here at the end. So <clears throat> uh, so I apologize if this may seem a bit too rapid fire. So uh, let's go ahead and get into it. So uh, again, what, what what prompted this was, you know, the um, um, the, the issue of uh, integrating women into uh, combat roles in the United States military. And, you know, the NATO conference here uh, a couple of years ago, uh, wanted to explore that deeply and kind of give it a more global uh, perspective and to uh, kind of allow uh, different nations who have been through this proce process to um, uh, to offer their perspectives and their experiences. But uh, I, I see the topic and the theme itself uh, being more uh, useful and more expansive than just um, uh, you know, the women who actually serve in the, the, these uh, um, specific uh, combat billets. Uh, and hopefully that speaks to uh, more broadly uh, the role of women in the United States military uh, writ large. And so, um, again, uh, my the prompt for this for me is, uh, again, kind of a professional and personal frustration uh, at examining the, the substance of of the debate and the professional discussion about, you know, the uh, uh, you know the enterprise and the process of of immigrating uh, uh, women in, into combat roles, and, and I, I found them very frustratingly uh, devolving into two buckets. Um, and so uh, the one that that clearly takes up the most bandwidth here uh, is that of, of physiology. Just just so much of the content of the discourse, you know, can, can be distilled down to this this this. Uh, almost quantitative um, um, debate over what, what, how much can a woman carry uh, as, as the sort of a, a quintessential benchmark if if uh, you know, an individual is worthy to serve in this role here. And I, I just found that extraordinarily uh, limiting and, and frustrating and, and um, uh, uh, counterproductive and myopic in that regard. So I, 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 I kind of want to shelve that conversation. You know, again, you know, physiology and and uh, you know, fitness, all those things are important, but um, as I'll point out here in a minute, I, I think we're missing the bigger picture. And then secondly, there was a parallel argument that was a little more sort of uh, a political in nature is that those who uh, lamented this this mandate and this process uh, as, as being uh, a, a bad faith effort uh, done by uh, national level politicians in there in order to score some kind of domestic political points in there that uh, that the United States military was unfairly being used as a quote unquote petri dish for social experimentation, uh, therefore intimating that that these changes in the reforms were, were, were being done for the wrong reasons. I also find that as a, a very problematic argument in there, which I want to get to here uh, momentarily. And so, so what I have here in the title of the slide and the title of this presentation is is a um, uh, is is a is a request, if not a plea, for all of us who are involved in. Um, you know, kind of the national security apparatus here when we're examining uh, the role of, of women in uh, combat roles and more broadly the role of, of women in our military. 
uh, can we can we reframe this discussion? Can can we back out uh, sort of the scope of this? Can we expand the aperture uh, and appreciate the broader context uh, of what this issue truly means more broadly to the United States, its military, and its society? Uh, because when we examine the nuances of of the process of of um, uh, you know, transitioning women into these roles, I, I want to argue to you that it opens a, a, a broader examination of the concept of military service itself. Uh, I'd ask a handful of questions here, which I bulletize on this slide. And it's a question that I don't think uh, that we as a military or we as a society or we as a polity uh, truly uh, engage with enough. And, and I fear we're, we're going to uh, continue to uh, endure the consequences of that, is really having an honest discussion about what does military service mean to our society, to our population, to our culture, to our government. Uh, and and, and this, this, this particular issue of, of, of women in combat roles is just a, a small sample of that. And by extension, um, it demands that we ask that the quintessential question that I find the most uh, uh, professionally and personally uh, engaging and challenging is, well, who serves? And in the process of answering that question of who serves, are we by extension identifying who matters? And so that that is kind of the, the broader sort of intellectual and philosophical um, um, request here for all of us who are involved in that. And so I, I want to talk a bit about more about, okay, where this came from. So I, I think the, the, the biggest reality that, that gets overlooked, and, and I'll, I'll say this a million times here, I, I believe unfortunately gets taken for granted, um, is the idea that serving in the military, being a soldier uh, in the United States uh, Department of Defense, uh, we have to, to, to accept and also embrace that uh, this has social and political meaning to it for the individual who's doing it, for the institution, and for the nation. And so, uh, again, uh, being an historian by, by training here, uh, we can trace this, this phenomenon, we can trace this paradigm all the way back to uh, not only the nation's founding, but the nation's settlement. Um, you, know, you see here, I got, I got a picture here of the Virginia militia uh, that was established in the 1630s. Uh, and the concept of a militia itself here, which has been very conspicuously integrated uh, not just into the American national security apparatus, but the broader American ethos here, is what we see here is the formalization and the connection of citizenship and military service, of being a part of a nation state and contributing to its national defense. And this is embodied by the philosophical concept of republicanism, that with the concept of a, a modern Western uh, democratic nation state, that uh, being a citizen uh, has a series of benefits, but also a, uh, a, a parallel series of, 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 of civic responsibilities to the nation state and to the polity. Uh, we, we can trace the origins of this back to the ancient world. Uh, so this was invented and practiced by the ancient Greeks and ancient Romans in there, uh, seeing the intersection here of, uh, of, of this dichotomous relationship, the symbiotic relationship uh, between the state and between the citizen. Uh, so the republicanism is the embodiment of that, okay, that, that the reason why there is a nation state in there, that it provides a series of, of, of services and advantages and um, institutions to the individual, everything from, from protection to government, uh, to rule of law, uh, to, to everything from supporting uh, institutions such as, such as uh, you know, education, sanitation, all of those things. Uh, but those things do not come for free that being a citizen uh, has a series of responsibilities to them to actually contribute to those institutions to make sure that they work. And we see that uh, carried over today into the 21st century uh, through um, uh, functions such as taxation uh, to make sure that there is funding to make sure that the government works uh, through um, uh, civic responsibilities such as jury duty. In order to maintain law and order, the individual must contribute uh, to that that larger system. Okay, so now you see this this dynamic of um, the individual citizens must contribute to the institutions in order for them to function and to have to have value. Uh, and the idea of republicanism is uh, a contribution to the common good. The common good being the nation state itself, both in function and idea. 
And so when it comes to the, the contribution of, of, of you know, a share of your money, uh, of your time and, and commitment to, to the judicial system, and thirdly, uh, the actual defense of the Republic itself, taking up arms to protect the nation state and protect the polity is again, a responsibility that provides both the function of protection, but also more broadly gives the Republic a sense of meaning. It gives it identity. Uh, you know, the ancient Greeks and ancient Romans understood that this experiment in Republican government needed to be validated by the civic contribution of Republicanism to ensure that the polity itself has meaning and it has value. This, this service of the citizens is what makes it real and what makes the nation state viable. Okay. So America has 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 you know, embraced this ideology. Um, and has seen it through this tradition of the citizen soldier, which has taken on various forms, and also um, parallel to that through the uh, process of conscription. Okay, the nation state demands and requires you to serve uh, it, it, under arms to protect the nation state. And so, so we've got over 300 years of, of applying this in various forms. Well, 1973, that that took an odd turn when um, you know the United States you know, moved away from. Uh, the draft and uh, decided to restructure its military as an all volunteer force. So uh, what there has been is a demand for a, 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 a kind of a, a restructuring and a reconciliation of that Republican tradition, uh, which still has not uh, truly um, um, you know, gotten it, its solidity yet almost 50 years later. Um, and but still, uh, even though we have an all volunteer force, my argument is, is that sort of um, you know, intellectually and emotionally, uh, American citizens and the American government still continue to make that association of military service and citizenship. That those who wear the uniform, those who take up arms in the protection of the Republic uh, represent uh, the most extreme and the most valued embodiment of what it means to be a citizen. The most extreme sacrifice, the most extreme selflessness and the most extreme a contribution to the common good that we still sort of heuristically uh, make that association and make that intersection, uh, not just in our minds, but in a lot of our behaviors and also our policies and institutions in there. So uh, one of the outgrowths of that is that, um, particularly for the call for as many citizens as possible, as all citizens to defend the Republic, particularly in time of national peril and war, we have seen this as an opportunity for the socially disadvantaged to use this uh, occasion to serve the nation as a vehicle to attain social equality. That by demonstrating that they, uh, through their actions and through their sacrifices, sometimes with their own lives, uh, show themselves worthy of, of the, 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 the highest value of citizenship. And we can trace that back through several hundred years through, through uh, those who have been marginalized uh, within American society to use military service as a springboard, as a vehicle to attain social equality in there, particularly those who serve in combat. Again, you know, the most dangerous, the most extreme of this thing. So, so that's kind of the background and the context. And, and this part of the American identity, I think we, we, we again, we take for granted and we just um, uh, kind of traditionally just identify this as, as a steady state of being. But over the last 50 years, you know, we, we've had to kind of re-examine this. And, and I think the conversation uh, deserves more attention. So in uh, providing these opportunities, uh, providing the, um, um, the, the availability of, of various populations within the broader polity uh, to serve, uh, it, it is unfortunately set up um, uh, some uh, or exacerbated natural tensions within the American civil military dynamic. And so uh, we've seen, seen here since the founding of the Republic that there is always uh, tension and friction uh, between the civilian government and the United States military. When it comes to the inclusion and participation of certain um, um, uh, uh, social groups um, uh, and, and those who are marginalized, it, it tends uh, to uh, amplify or exacerbate a lot of those uh, those tensions. And so, uh, so the, the, this this distance between uh, the military and the government, the civil military gap, is also oftentimes reflected in, between the military and society. And the debate and and the uh, challenges when it comes to certain outgroups uh, looking for the opportunity to serve or looking for certain opportunities within the military, uh, it tends to stress that civil dynamic. And when a lot of these changes and reforms do not come organically from within the United States military itself, when it is forced from either you know, the population or the representative government, 
uh, the military kind of by its nature uh, tends to resist those. They uh, feel a, an absence of autonomy and an absence of agency, and they feel victimized and put upon. Um, and, and they feel that their ability uh, to, to, to be managers of violence, to, to be defenders of the republics has been um, uh, potentially uh, put into peril. So uh, that is also a, a parallel dynamic we have um, with, within uh, American history itself. So again, that's kind of a, a, a uh, kind of corollary background here as well. So um, for anybody who, who, who studies civil military relations, um, again, I, for all the courses I teach on this, I, I'm a huge proponent of understanding and appreciating um, uh, the, the theories that have gone behind this in the intellectual tradition. And so, um, again, I don't have enough time to, 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 to highlight the thoughts of all of these, these two scholars here, Samuel Huntington and Morris Janowitz, but uh, uh, these two individuals are the real foundation, are the real bedrock for uh, United States of civil military uh, theory. Um, so the reason why I want to include them in this conversation is that uh, the, the, the acknowledgement and the corporation of their ideas uh, I see as directly connected to my, to my broader um, uh, plea here uh, to put this theme in a broader civil military context. Uh, so in, in an oversimplistic distillation of both of these individuals' concepts of civil military relations, um, Samuel Huntington uh, saw the military professional as, as being the most effective uh, when the military professional is most separate from society. He wanted the greatest gap as possible from the civilian universe. You know, he saw a lot of their values, a lot of their ideals as inherently dangerous to the profession and to the protection of the Republic. He saw the military as what he called a unique social institution that needed its own values, its own ethos, uh, and, and those you know, clearly being a very small C conservative. Uh, in order for them to, to best apply their profession of managing violence. So the further the military was away from society, the more uh, safe, uh, the more protected he saw the nation state would be. And again, putting this in the context of, of the middle of the Cold War, you know, he, he, he saw that as a, a fundamental reality. Uh, uh, Professor Morris Janowitz, a, a sociologist by training, um, had a different take on this. Um, even if American society and American politicians wanted a distance between the military and society, he says that there are just natural trends that are bringing these two institutions uh, together. Um, because the military itself uh, draws its personnel from society, they're gonna bring with them their ideals, their values, their skill sets, their experiences into the profession itself. And he saw that as fundamentally uh, being a good thing being an advantage and that if the military professional was kind of more cognizant of this uh, connection between the military and society, that they would actually be, be more effective in, in, in the pursuit of their profession. And so what you have here is a contrary or sort of opposite perspective that, okay, the military and society should actually uh, be close together. There's a gravitational pull for both of those things. And it is actually a net positive uh, for the Republic. So, um, you know, I always kind of harken back to these two uh, uh, kind of dichotomous perspectives on, okay, what, what, what should that relationship be between society and between the military profession? So I always like to highlight uh, both of their, their theories. All right, so um, uh, for, for all of the debate, wailing and gnashing of teeth that we, we have seen here over the last uh, decade, um, as, as, you, as the Department of Defense has pursued, uh, you know, this, this process of, of integrating um, you know, women in, 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 into combat roles here, into combat MOSs. Uh, again, uh, most of that discussion uh, goes back to, to the two uh, bad faith arguments that I put on the first slide here. So what I'm offering here is, is an alternative, um, you know, to, 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 to that framing. And, uh, you know, the first here is, you know, connecting back to the construct of citizenship of having that be uh, of, 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 of service to the nation state is a demonstration and a validation of value as a citizen to the Republic and should also provide opportunity both, and, uh, both within and outside uh, the military. So uh, within the military itself, having its own culture, uh, it, it is not just you know, anecdotally validated, but also through, through reams and reams of data that um, those, uh, Within the profession who serve in combat arms, 
statistically uh, end up um, um, being those in, in the highest levels of, of command and responsibility as general officers. So uh, by, by, by putting roadblocks and putting obstructions to certain parts of, of the military population from uh, having that path, um, you know, that, 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 that's clearly um, you know, a, 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 um, an unnecessary obstruction, particularly if general officers not only have value within the military itself, we have this parallel phenomenon that's happened in the last generation or so, or arguably, if not longer, uh, that general officers are seen to have a greater value to society. Uh, we have seen that their uh, experiences um, leading large military organizations that uh, both government, uh, business, and society see that as having tremendous value. And they have great cachet, both in our political process and our, our, our economic and, and, and social paradigms in there. And so, um, so the absence of opportunity in there is one of kind of restricting that of, of, of what a citizen can and cannot do. Now, when it comes to the uh, actual application of the military profession itself, um, you know, I, 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 I want to encourage a vectoring away from the uh, uh, oversimplified and problematic uh, um, uh, paradigm of always viewing military service and who serves and what they do through this lens of quote unquote lethality. I by no means want to take away, you know, the fundamental core of the military profession that, as Huntington said, is the managers of violence. But we need to take a, a broader aperture here of how the United States military is using its forces in the pursuit and application of its policies. And, and I think for anybody who's, who's, who's been in the military, for the last you know, 10 to 20 years, uh, we have seen um, its actions, its deployments, its missions uh, greatly uh, expand beyond that just of destructiveness and explosions and, 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 and violence. Uh, the United States has become an increasingly uh, viable and, and, and frequently used instrument of national policy um, uh, and 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 we have we have seen that uh, um, you know formalized here over the last generation and so 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 part of the plea to to um, allow women in the combat roles is is also highlighting uh, and appreciating that the military does does a lot more than quote unquote lethality and so as much as general officers have have made this um, um, a firm stance on on lethality being the, being the uh, the primary uh, uh, imperative within the profession, uh, we have also seen a, a parallel um, um, prioritization of the demand for critical thinkers. For those of us who are in professional military education, we, we, we see this shouted just about every year. Um, general officers, particularly at the four-star rank, have made this a conspicuously uh, part of uh, you know, their, 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 uh, their policies, um, uh, they've seen this as part of their uh, larger missions, and they've made this a conspicuous part of their rhetoric. Uh, again, I, I teach the class here at, at Command and Staff on critical thinking. I put up a slide that has a series of cut and pasted quotes you know, for, from commandants and, and, for, and from the Joint Chiefs saying, I want critical thinkers. I want critical thinkers. Well, um, let's cast a wide net for whom we can include in being critical thinkers here and the positions in which they apply that critical thinking. And for those who are in combat units who are at the tip of the proverbial spear as the appliers of the American national policy and are the ones having to do in that critical thinking, you know, the diversity of their experiences, the diversity of their thoughts, uh, the diversity of their backgrounds and their, those, those are just naturally enhancers for a critical thinking process. So I wanna highlight that. And then concurrently with that, uh, the presence of the United States military, just by it, it being in certain places and advertising itself as an agent of the United States more broadly, not just specifically through the narrow ends of its destructiveness and violence, but if the United States military is supposed to be used here for the last 20 years as a representation of what the United States is more broadly and philosophically, its values, its ideals, its priorities, its morals, isn't it in the best interest to deploy a force that looks the most like who we are when it comes to demographically and aesthetically? If they are the true agents, if they are the true advertisers of everything that is good about uh, the American ethos and the American experiment and, and the American uh, uh, 
polity here, uh, isn't it of greatest advantage uh, for policy more broadly to, to get a, a, a force that, that not only looks like uh, the United States, but also kind of thinks and functions like it more broadly, the inclusiveness of all of its citizenry, if that makes sense. Uh, so lastly here, uh, you, know, you know, fortunately for, for, um, for DOD, um, the good news is, you know, we are well on the road to the, uh, um, to the gender integration process, but, but that no means uh, indicates that, that the challenges are, are over here. So, uh, so the real um, focus and priority at this point is the assessment of that process, you know, because there have clearly been bumps along the, along the road here. And so, uh, <clears throat> you know, there, there is a, a real imperative here to ensure that uh, the assessment of this process is 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 detailed and accurate to ensure that these transitions are are happening and that um, uh, that that the integration is as seamless as possible and that um, the the opportunities uh, to actualize citizen and uh, citizenship and apply citizenship is is being uh, pursued universally here uh, in all of the services and, and then lastly you know if if there's still uh, a hangover. Uh, from uh, from the process itself, uh, if there is still uh, internal resistance institutionally within the government, within the government dichotomy between well, what's more important, rights or readiness? Um, I, I, I kind of leave with this thought here. I, I still consider this a false dichotomy. I've never understood or comprehended how this is an either or. You can either have you know you know you know women or whatever whatever uh, uh, population they can have their rights or we we can have a, a lethal ready force. I still don't understand why you can't have both and why don't you see the former as an enabler of the latter? Uh, that demonstrates to me uh, again a very myopic concept of what this all means um, as far as what the military is and what the military represents. And always viewing the, the pursuit of reforms like this as a liability and not seeing it as an opportunity to succeed in the pursuit of policy, uh, to, to accomplish missions, to leverage all of that talent and all of that capability uh, for, for institutions that always celebrate themselves as, as, as being you know, you know, you know, adaptive and creative and, 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 and always wanting advantage and opportunity. I, why don't we kludge these two together and see them as cooperative rather than combative? So I, I, I encourage that proposal uh, being included in, into the discussion. So, uh, but I, I, I think that also comes uh, as an outgrowth of, again, expanding kind of the, the, the broader parameters of this to say, okay, uh, are we asking the question of what a service means, who serves and who matters? I think those, those interrogatives connect to these, these sort of final points here and hopefully can, can change the content and the context of the conversation and hopefully um, you know, the discussions, the decisions, and hopefully the policies and eventually application down the road here for the U.S. military. So uh, that is what I have for you here, uh, uh, crew like folks. So I appreciate you uh, listening to that, and I, I, I look forward to your questions here. Thank you much. Hey, Dr. Wyman. So maybe while folks are thinking about any questions they have, um, could I get you to just elaborate a little bit? You mentioned at um, the beginning of your presentation that you uh, wrote a paper and delivered a presentation for a NATO conference here at MCU a few years ago. Was there anything else that kind of led you to this topic or fueled your passion for this topic um, that you can elaborate on for the group? Yeah, sure. So I, I, I've always been interested in uh, the, the, this, this question of the relationship between military and society, going all the way back to grad school again, you know, my, my, my dissertation was about antebellum uh, Southern military education. And so I, I argued that, you know, there was an intersection within those, those military schools and seeing, okay, that there are values within the military that would make uh, ideal citizens. And so I've always been fascinated by uh, that dynamic of, of the people who serve and why and what does service means, what does the relationship between military and society. So in my scholarship, I've always sort of uh, pursued that, that, that question and I've gotten deeper and deeper into it. Uh, but also concurrently through my own personal experience, uh, I found that interest amplified by, by my own service. Uh, you know, being in the Marine Reserves uh, sort of, 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 of highlighted uh, all of the nuances of that. And for those who have served in the Reserves, uh, you can appreciate, or the National Guard, you're always in this weird place where, where you're, you're kind of citizen and you're kind of soldier and you're kind of both and neither at the same time. 
And then, you know, uh, I had two uh, very uh, impactful billets in the reserve here in, in the last few years. Uh, I served as a career counselor in um, in reserve affairs, where you know I, I would help you know um, reserve NCOs and staff NCOs with their with their kind of career paths and getting ready for promotion and all that. Uh, and then from there, I served with the uh, uh, talent management oversight directorate, um, you know, which looked at um, uh, th th this new phenomenon and this new priority of of uh, of talent management within uh, Marine Corps manpower. And so, so both of those experiences as a reservist really uh, highlighted and amplified this, this you know, intellectual and professional curiosity I've always had is, okay, well, who serves and, and, and how do we use people? Uh, what is that dynamic like? Um, and then kind of by extension, that, that kind of got me into the WPS stuff in there. Because I see that as, as a, a very sort of specific subtopic is, okay, well, well, who who is volunteering to serve? Why and 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 what are we doing to get the most out of their service, their talents, their capabilities? Uh, and 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 what is the feedback loop to, to their experience more broadly as a citizen by that experience? So, uh, so it, it's been kind of an adult lifetime that I've I've kind of touched on this in different capacities, but um, uh, but yeah, it's, it's been terrific fun. Thanks so much for that. And and I should add too that like it's great to have male allies in an effort that's titled Women, Peace, and Security. And so along with Dr. Wyman, we do have male students, which is wonderful in the WPS Scholars Program, um, which is just again great in terms of amplifying the diversity of perspectives that have been brought to this issue. Um, so we have a, a question from the director of the Krulak Center, Val Jackson, uh, who says, of course, thanks to Brad. I've given the depth and complexity of the current threat combined with the continued issues of female integration, do you believe it would be po a positive step for Congress to update uh, the selective service to include women? Well, I, I, I had two answers to that. Uh, one, I, I always have this, this kind of troubling intellectual relationship with, with selective service and, and the potential of, of, of conscription or, or a draft coming down the road, because I still think we haven't gotten to the point of where that is kind of functionally practical in the paradigm of national defense, um, uh, trying to fashion a scenario in future war where we're going to need you know, several million uh, individuals in uniform. I, I, seeing if that is, is a scenario where, where that would happen, I, I kind of get stuck in, in that being uh, a reality. Uh, but I, I, I am open to this idea of, of women being available to selective service because it goes back to my original thesis is that is a duty and responsibility of citizenship that has been codified in the Western tradition going back 400 years. And so for, for all citizens within the polity to get the opportunity to validate that citizenship, that, that is a demand and that is a responsibility. Uh, so I am, I am open to that idea, if, if, if not philosophically and sociopolitically more than anything, if that makes sense. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I didn't know. I mean, again, we had uh, you know some great discussion on this topic last week, and um, Major Brown with, and other members of the Krulak Center to include the the WPS uh, POC for the Marine Corps, Lieutenant Colonel Manny Cepeda was there, of course, and uh, we have a WPS um, SME, Dr. Anahid Matosian, who was there. So you know, we had these great discussions. Of course, the students um, are are the center of it all, and and make it fantastic. Um, I was wondering, maybe Major Brown, if if you could just say a couple words about sort of the comment and question you had connecting this to Afghanistan last week, because I thought it was a great point you might want to bring up to the group today. Yeah, sure thing, ma'am. And uh, I've given the uh, the time to think about it. I think I have a better way of phrasing it than I did um, initially. Um, so, you know, both Dr. Wyman and Dr. McKenzie, um, you know, m the thing I had posed in the last session was looking at, you know, our, our recent withdrawal from Afghanistan and, you know, the, the ultimate failure to achieve the national goals there that we wanted to for two decades. Could this be a a forcing function or a catalyst for um, for really drilling down into the the hard questions that that get into the what matters and who matters in the context of you know gender integration in the military and you know who who we're asking to serve and what we're asking them to do um, and and you know sort of I was being slightly flippant but not not really I was being mostly serious when I when I phrase it like this you know 
to that initial point of the you know like the the physicality aspects of it right that 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 always seems to be the stray voltage that people go to and you know recaging those questions about you know can they can a, can a woman carry a 50 pound pack versus a 70 pound pack in the context of what just happened to us in afghanistan did we fail because we were out pt by the taliban did we fail because they could carry heavier packs did we fail because we were out groomed or because they have a better body composition program than we do and if the answers to those questions are no does is this a chance now maybe to um to you know use those answers of no to to drive to senior leadership that we need to ask different questions about what really matters in that context because the ones that always seem to keep popping up you know whether whether either from in front of congress to you know social media the ones that get all the attention don't seem to be the ones that ultimately led to failure in our most recent war. Mic drop. That was awesome, Ian. Thank you. I, I just, it was like ringing in my ears after you said it last week. So thanks for sharing that with the group. Brad, any comments on that or anything else? I, I'm just, I'm hoping, you know, that my server might be a little slow, so I might not be seeing if other questions are coming up. I'm not seeing it in the chat, but Brad, anything else to add? Um, no, no, and and I definitely second Ian's point here. You know, being a military story, I I got a whole shelves and shelves of, of books here about war. You know, and and can we look over the last several thousand years and indicate okay that 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 every army that has been victorious historically is the one that does the most pull ups. Um, you know, it it really does kind of highlight you know the broader question of okay, you know, not only who is serving but how we are using them. And why? And and it is it, I, I understand and appreciate the inherent challenge of, of those uh, within military leadership uh, to to have to balance you know the the, the need to, to have standards and understanding and appreciating the physicality you know of war and of war fighting. But at the same time, um, there is this larger question that that Val Jackson brought up in our discussion last week of. Uh, we really don't want to admit the uh, struggles that we are starting to have in getting people to serve. Uh, this all volunteer force is starting to, sh to show cracks and it is starting to invite broader questions within the military about kind of the parameters and, and the expectations uh, that they set sort of within the process of serving uh, to hopefully get the most out of people uh, and to make it more effective because um, that sense of republicanism that I had mentioned uh, earlier earlier there, and I, I gave this is my paper at IUS, Lauren, that I did a, a couple months ago, is uh, that is starting to atrophy. And so uh, the reasons and motivations for individual citizens now serving uh, is having to be complemented with motivations beyond just patriotism and service to the republic. Uh, and so the uh, the demand signal to to get people to wear their uniform uh, is getting more and more complicated. Uh, and to to attain not only that talent but also that diversity, uh, we're seeing that stress being put on the individual services in the Department of Defense to kind of rearrange and recapture their concept of talent and who matters and what constitutes value of the individuals who do serve. And so I just see the beginnings of that conversation happening. How that will unfold, I don't know, but but I think that's an extension of, 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 of Ian's point. Over. Yeah, thanks for that. We we have um, a question from Sharon Sisparo, who is in the WPS Scholars Program, and she said, sir, you know, thanks for the presentation. Do you have any suggestions for how the same message can reach our youngest Marines? Meaning, is there a way to simplify this message in order to build a foundation from which we can grow? Uh, so, so here's the weird thing. Um, from, from what I've gathered from anecdotally and some of the scholarship that's on that, when it comes to this idea, you know, specifically of, of, of women serving in combat roles and sort of these you know, otherwise marginalized populations, uh, this, this most recent generation, Generation Z, they are the least resistant to it. Uh, that they have grown up in a society and they've kind of grown up in a culture where, where this is uh, far more normal. Um, so uh, the, the real uh, impedimentia here or the real challenges aren't in, from what I've seen, kind of the PFCs and Lance Corporals, uh, it's in senior leadership. So uh, if anything, I would uh, encourage to the, to the junior members of all the ranks here is to make your ideas and your normalizations of these sort of social 
their, their concerns, uh, uh, their worries, their misgivings are, are probably unfounded, that they have kind of grown up in this dynamic and, and this culture and that, that it's okay and it, it's still really good and really, really positive. So, so Sharon, I don't know if that answers your question, but um, that's kind of my take on it. Thanks so much for that. We do have uh, one last question uh, here before we wrap up. It's um, it's from Curtis who says, if one of the keys to building a critical thinker or integrative mindset is to start early in a Marine's career, have you seen any evidence from the new infantry training battalion model that can directly or indirectly support gender integration views for the next generation? Uh, he says that the new AIT focus is on understanding and uh, employing the capabilities of their team given a specific mission, vice rote memorization of capabilities in employment TTPs. Yeah, I, I'm not as familiar as what's going on in uh, over at the, uh, the infantry school per se. Uh, I, I have seen kind of uh, 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 adjunct to that uh, a lot of the education that is happening in, in the uh, NCO and staff NCO community here within the PME uh, universe is that they are kind of transitioning their mindset of placing greater value on critical thinking and thinking in general and and uh, sort of the, the intellectual nature of the profession vice, you know, kind of the, the rote memorization and the accomplishment uh, and mastery of, of tasks. And so uh, I am encouraged if, if that's a, a broader current that is happening uh, kind of within uh, the profession in its sort of uh, kind of this next generation of leadership, I, I hope that eventually translates uh, into a mindset that will allow things like gender integration, a lot of these other things uh, uh, to be more successful. If that answers your question, over. Um, so Dr. Florek, she's our, our Director of Faculty Development here at Marine Corps University. She was asking in Shamim Mir's report on gender and citizenship, he states, gendered exclusion from citizenship is linked to the public-private divide that identifies men's roles as being in the public world of politics and paid employment and women's in caring and child rearing at home. And so her question is, at what rate do you see this evolving? And do you think it's evolving to catch up with women in the workplace, generally speaking, at an acceptable rate and, and how that applies to the, the military gender integration question? No, no it, it, it's a good question, Tim. And, and I, I like the fact that you, 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 you started this, this, this idea with kind of broader society and broader culture and then sort of you know, kind of funnel that into military dynamic and I, I think it is that sort of approach to these problems which, which really needs to be highlighted is that you know these these uh, you know, these, these issues and these frictions and these challenges within the military are really extensions of these broader definitions of our our, our, our broader uh, kind of social socio-cultural and, and political uh, uh, constructs and so uh, to your question again I'm still optimistic that the younger generation can change the tenor of the language uh, but a lot of those will say, you know, very generously, your kind of traditional concepts of gender uh, still very much uh, linger uh, in the attitudes and, and the concepts that I've seen, um, in, particularly in the officer corps. Uh, I, I say it's getting, getting slightly better as uh, you know, they, they start to kind of change and evolve over time, but I, I'd still say that, that you know, uh, women being viewed as, 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 as caretakers and more particularly needing to be protected. I've had that come up a lot uh, when I teach this lesson in my civ mill class uh, is still in the majority. So whatever time is a generational shift happens. Over. And I might also add, um, I know we're just about running out of time here, um, if we're talking about generational differences. Um, so yesterday I sat in uh, here at Marine Corps University's War College. Uh, we had a very new module on emotional intelligence, uh, which we just piloted last year. And this was the second year of having this, this course uh, for lieutenant colonels. And um, as like you said, I think there is some generational differences in sort of how we talk about gender, think about diverse perspectives, um, and that there is evidence that um, maybe the younger generation is more fluent in the emotional vocabulary and, and thinking about, uh, again, gender differences. But at the same time, one of the things that the younger generation is not as familiar with or skilled at is delayed gratification <laughs> or, you know, kind of like, you know, waiting uh, slowly for things 
things to happen the way that those of us in our 40s and 50s maybe have had to do when we were younger. So I think there are certainly advantages and disadvantages <laughs> to the uh, younger generation coming in as well as the older generation that's currently leading the Marine Corps. So uh, just some food for thought there. Major Brown, any uh, closing words before we before we wrap up? So uh, yeah, I think we're, I got no more questions in the chat. So thank you to everyone in the audience um, for your, for putting those questions to our, our guests here today. And uh, my thanks to doctors, uh, Dr. Wyman, Dr. McKenzie for agreeing to do this on, on pretty short notice. Um, uh, we basically jumped them at the end of the WPS session last week. And we're like, you know, you've, you've got a few days to think about it. Do you want to do it? And they very graciously signed up to do it. So we're appreciate your flexibility and, support and we're of course happy on our side to you know to to shine the light on what's going on in the wps scholars program so to our audience uh, uh thank you for joining us today at our uh, kind of a non-standard date and time but uh, we had a great turnout so we appreciate you taking the time to do that from the kulak center side we will have one final broadcast to offer next week to round out our calendar year where we'll be extremely fortunate to host retired colonel anthony wood united states marine corps who will discuss a large planning challenge that was thrown into his lap when he was a captain, namely the evacuation of Saigon in 1975. He'll be joining us next Thursday morning, so make sure you're following us on social media to receive registration details. And also make sure you're following us because we're going to have some other end-of-year updates coming out on social media as we get closer to the new year, including a review of our best writing contest, ent contest entries, our top broadcast episodes from the year, and uh, our second year running of Team Kulak's holiday reading list. So thank you all again, and we'll see you here next week. Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected.